Welcome to this webcast from Union Solidarity International. Today we are being joined live in Wisconsin with Brian Rothgerry who is here to speak to us about the Palermo's pizzas dispute and the, the strike that is ongoing and has been for a number of months. It's a very important and vital campaign as you will hear from Brian today. Welcome to the webcast Brian and thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to uh, talk with folks around the world around um, uh, uh, around the world about the Palermo strike. It's a really important struggle, and um, it's probably the biggest labor struggle happening in uh, the state of Wisconsin right now, which, as you know, has, has seen a lot of uh, labor strife over the past couple of years. Um, our governor is world famous for for trying to uh, take away workers' rights. Um, that was an attack on public employees <clears throat> who are governed by state law. Um, there's been a lot of fights in the private sector as well, um, which is by federal labor law, um, including the strike at Palermo's Pizza. Um, we're now in our fourth month of the strike at uh, Palermo's Pizza, uh, and uh, Palermo's is um, a real uh, innovator in the frozen pizza industry, um, and actually they, they claim credit for sort of inventing the frozen pizza. Started out as a small uh, local pizzeria here in Milwaukee uh, and grew very quickly. Um, and, you know, currently um, there's a, a very large factory in Milwaukee's Menominee Valley um, that uh, employs a little over 200 people. And they make a wide variety of uh, frozen pizzas that are sold um, around the country um, at a major uh, warehouse uh, retailer, a discount warehouse store called Costco. And Costco Wholesale is actually an international store um, and has uh, stores in the UK and Australia and Canada, uh, and I believe in Mexico as, as well. Um, they have over 600 stores worldwide. So, um, you know, there, um, this is um, an uh, international boycott, we hope, um, that, um, that we're engaged in to put pressure on, on the company to do the right thing. Um, what we're asking is simple. We're asking Palermo's to recognize uh, the workers' union, the Palermo Workers' Union, uh, and we're asking them to reinstate the uh, union supporters that they fired uh, back in, in June, and we're asking for a fair contract. And so, you know, we're sort of, um, obviously, the, you know, we're still on strike because the company is refusing to meet those demands, and we are waiting for uh, the federal government to weigh in, uh, the National Labor Relations Board, which... Um, overseas private sector labor law in the United States has been investigating Palermo's for illegally firing up to 90 union supporters. And uh, we hope that there will be a complaint issued soon and uh, that that legal ruling um, will give us some momentum. And ultimately, we may, in fact, get what's called a bargaining order, which is where the labor board um, requires uh, a company, an employer, to recognize a union and essentially forego uh, a government-sponsored uh, secret ballot election because the labor board <clears throat> um, uh, has determined that the employer has so poisoned the environment that there can never be a free and fair election. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in this case, a supermajority of the employees already expressed their support for a union. We had more than 75% of the workers uh, sign a petition requesting union recognition. So it's pretty clear in this case that the union, uh, that the workers want a union um, and uh, you know, we're now in this protect, protracted dispute looking for additional ways to put pressure on the company so that when we do, in fact, get that bargaining order, um, that um, we will have the momentum on our side and be able to quickly negotiate a first contract. Mm -hmm. That's that's really fascinating overview, Brian, and thank you very much for that. I mean, Union Solidarity International has taken a real keen interest in this dispute perhaps provoked by what was going on in the state of Wisconsin at the time. Of course, the attack in public sector workers and their bargaining rights, and this dispute seemed to be in the mix at the same time. And we've been very pleased and proud to give oxygen and to amplify the, the demands of this campaign and a fantastic campaign that you've run, and we're pleased to be associated with the fight for justice. This is a really fascinating and quite a complex dispute, actually, isn't it, Brian? Because as you mentioned there, in relation to the, the Labour Board, that a number of workers were fired while there was an ongoing uh, pressure and campaign 
to get union recognition when the workers were fired and also the element of migrant workers as well uh, which right. the, the federal authorities shouldn't be as my understanding intervening when there was an ongoing labour dispute could you just give us a yeah. bit of a backdrop to some of these fascinating dynamics in this dispute sure. and the dirty tricks by Palermo's pizzas to fire the workers when they were fully aware of this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thanks for the, the support from USI and, <clears throat> and helping you know uh, lift up this struggle and, and raise the profile. We really appreciate your support. Um, and, and to the immigration questions and the you know the complexities with immigration law and labor law, I mean yes, this is um, a really rare uh, instance um, where um, uh, labor law and immigration law are both um, you know um, you know key to sort of um, what's happening here and have, will play a significant role in the outcome. And, um, you know, as, as many folks know, um, in, in um, most countries around the world, including the United States, um, workers are routinely intimidated, harassed, or fired for trying to organize a union. Um, in the United States, um, that's illegal. That was made illegal, um, uh, you know, over uh, 70 years ago, <clears throat> um, over 75 years ago, uh, with the National Labor Relations Act. But, of course, employers can fire uh, union supporters and do all the time. It's their most effective way of, of crushing a union organizing drive. And um, what has sort of um, um, what happened? What's happened here is that the employer has fired uh, 90 workers who are all union supporters, but they're saying that they had no choice because these workers were um, um, undocumented immigrants and therefore ineligible to work. And as many folks know, you know, there are millions of undocumented uh, immigrant uh, workers in the United States um, who are employed um, and, um, you know, who are actually paying taxes, uh, paying payroll taxes, um, pay sales taxes um, as well, contributing to society. Um, but there are, um, you know, regular um, uh, attempts to deport these workers and um, thousands of workers are deported every year. <clears throat> the way this happens is the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is now part of the Homeland Security, will audit a workplace um, if they suspect that there are undocumented workers there. And uh, they provide employers with a list that they call uh, a suspect documents list, where they think there may be some discrepancy in the, um, in the records um, uh, that employees submit um, you know, uh, to you know, put on, put on file in terms of you know their uh, their status, their eligibility status as workers in the U.S. So um, in this case, there was an audit of Palermo's ongoing before the strike started, <clears throat> but the workers you know didn't know there was an audit because um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, does not uh, inform the workers that they're audited; they inform the company. And meanwhile, the workers were frustrated around health and safety issues and were organizing around that and had been doing so for years, and were very frustrated in getting nowhere in their demands for a safe workplace. They were tired of getting their hands cut in the machinery and, um, you know, severe lacerations um, and near amputations in some cases <clears throat> and other serious injuries uh, that did result in uh, federal fines against the company. So the workers uh, organized a union and, uh, you know, as I said, the supermajority signed union cards. And when they submitted that petition to the, uh, to the company, the response was, oh, well, you know, um, in fact, there's an ICE audit here uh, and you need to shut your papers and you have 28 days. So the workers were understandably caught off guard. Um, they asked for more time and the company said, no, you can have less time, you can have 10 days. Mm -hmm. So the workers, you know, then obviously knew something was up. So um, um, they contacted ICE and um, asked what was going on. And ICE said, well, there is actually no deadline here. Um, we haven't set a deadline. And only ICE has enforcement authority when it comes to immigration law. Employers do not. So uh, in this case, the employer was essentially um, claiming that they had um, the authority that ICE has uh, in demanding uh, workers turn in their, their papers by this deadline. So um, the workers, uh, um, you know, could see that they were, um, you know, being manipulated by the company that was exploiting labor law. Um, and... Um, and they told the, uh, ICE that they were trying to organize a union. And the really interesting thing about this is that um, in this case, uh, ICE decided to suspend its audit of the workplace because of the labor dispute. And that's never happened before in the United States. Yeah. 
Uh, this is the first time ever that ICE has suspended a workplace audit uh, because of a labor dispute. And that's because there's actually um, something called the Memorandum of Understanding, which is a sort of an administrative rule um, that's based on, um, on law uh, that was um, entered into between um, ICE and um, its um, parent agency, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Labor Department, where they made a very explicit agreement that um, ICE's immigration enforcement powers would not be uh, used to um, engage in union buying. And they very specifically said they would not allow employers to exploit ICE's immigration enforcement powers in order to bust a union. And so when ICE saw that that's what was happening here, in this case with Planos, ICE suspended its audit. Um, and so that essentially sent a clear message to the uh, employer that no enforcement action should be taken. And they essentially, you know, reminding the employer that um, this supposed deadline um, was not an ICE deadline and that ICE was not going to be taking any enforcement action and that the company shouldn't either. But then the next day is when the employer fired the first wave of 25 union supporters. Um, now, the workers knew what was going on and saw this coming. coming. Uh, and they went on strike um, before uh, the first wave of 75 workers were fired. So we have clear effort of concerted activity, which is uh, was protected by U.S. law. Concerted um, protected activity uh, for mutual interest is, is clearly protected. So we have the workers um, filing a petition for recognition and going out on strike uh, to protest um, the actions of the employer. Um, so there's clear evidence here that you know this is a, a labor dispute. Um, and the Labor Board, we think, understands that and will issue a complaint against the company for um, their violations of labor law, uh, even though the company is trying to use this uh, very complex and confusing issue of immigration law um, as a pretense uh, for firing the workers um, and an ability to hide, you know, hide their actions, deflect, critis deflect criticism, um, and distract the public, uh, legislators, decision makers, uh, and consumers from what's really going on. Brian, uh, that's that's really interesting. First, uh, just a short question, which is um, how many people are affected by this? How many people are on strike? And then second, I'm interested in the actual campaigning that you're doing because you seem to be doing some quite a, quite a good job, um, firstly in terms of social media and, and getting the message out. I mean, this is a group mm -hmm. of workers who are, I suppose, relatively vulnerable uh, in, in the labor market and quite easy at least Paloma's probably believes quite easy to isolate uh, people, some of them without perhaps proper paperwork and, and easy to I isolate and cut off from the rest of the of, of the labor movement. And you've clearly managed to raise the profile of this campaign uh, so that it's, it's quite high and it's um, it, it has a lot of support and you've be, you seem to have been quite strategic in the way you've tackled uh, the supply chain and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and Costco and um, the, the companies that Paloma supplies. So uh, I think there's, there's, right. there's, there's some really useful lessons there for yeah. other people in, 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 in struggle in, in other parts of the world. So we'd be really interested to hear uh, quite how you managed to do that and also what the impact has been, how, how, how successful that's been. Right. Well, um, folks should know that the strike is, is very strong. Uh, there is a strike fund um, and the strike fund is, is doing well. Um, in terms of um, the uh, you know resources available to to provide financial support to the workers who um, who are you know not on the job, <clears throat> um, we uh, I think the count is about eighty workers um, who are who are on strike who are um, regularly part of our strike actions and walk walking the picket line, and um, of course there are, uh, are other supporters uh, inside the plant uh, who are not fired. Um, who are still working there, um, who uh, essentially, you know, we consider, you know, part of our support base. Um, now, um, in terms of, you know, social media, um, you know, um, social media in this day and age is, is essential to any campaign like this. Um, we have a, a strike blog at uh, sliceofjustice.com where we uh, try to post updates about what's happening with the campaign and, and post photos. We also uh, use Facebook um, and uh, our Facebook page is Support Striking Palermo's Workers, and uh, we post a lot of um, uh, our events and activity up there. Um, and we have a fairly wide reach. Um, we only have about 1,800 uh, followers on Facebook, um, but that's, um, that's a pretty good uh, showing. You know, it would, I would love to have, you know, 18,000. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a lot better because we are trying to put national pressure 
um, on Costco, or excuse me, on, on Palermo's. Um, so, you know, what you mentioned about Costco and, and the targeting of Costco is, is also really important because um, Costco wholesale in the United States is seen as uh, sort of the anti-Walmart. They're, they were, um, you know, considered uh, a competitor to Walmart on sort of the, the, um, the wholesale, you know, um, uh, sort of um, a discount, you know, bulk you know, purchasing, uh, you know, market, uh, I guess really be a comparison to Sam's club, which is Walmart's, um, a membership, you know, sort of, um, based uh, store where you buy in bulk, but cost perceived as, as a, um, as a, um, you know, worker, worker friendly company, uh, that pays, uh, relatively fair wages, decent wages and offers benefits. Um, and, uh, Costco also has a, something called a supplier code of conduct. Uh, which very specifically states that any manufacturer that makes products for Costco um, will respect workers' rights to organize and uh, will um, respect uh, workers' rights to um, work in a uh, safe and healthy uh, workplace. So, um, so that's some good leverage for us, and, and we've been appealing Costco on those grounds, asking Costco to live up to um, its reputation as a company that respects workers' rights. In fact, Costco actually has uh, 15,000 out of about 90,000 employees uh, represented uh, by uh, the Teamsters, uh, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. So we know they do respect workers' rights. Um, But, um, you know, it's been a challenge to get Costco to to actually live up to that code of conduct. So we are continuing to engage in actions at Costco uh, around the country. Um, We've been engaging Costco members and asking Costco members uh, to participate in a um, uh, sort of a story project. We're trying to generate um, an Internet meme that's um, basically a photograph. Like if I were to, say, take a snapshot of, um, you know, um, of myself right here in front of my computer uh, webcam, um, holding up a piece of paper um, that, um, you know, tells a little story about, um, being a Costco member and supporting the boycott, you may have seen this kind of internet meme before where, um, you know, say, for example, around the 99% movement in the United States, people would tell their little story on a piece of paper and uh, take a picture of it. And that has really caught on in the United States uh, as, um, a, as a tactic people can use to uh, tell a, a story in a succinct but compelling way because you can see a person's face with their story, and it's a real person and a real story. So we're trying to get Costco members to, to um, you know, basically publicly um, take a picture of themselves and say that they support the strike. And so that's another way that we're trying to integrate, you know, social media campaigning, uh, make it horizontal so people can do it on their own, that it doesn't require a heavy lift of organizing, but it's, it's very focused and targeted um, uh, and uses a high high road sort of argument about um, living up to good corporate values, mm-hmm. and we're optimistic that that Costco will do the right thing here um, and uh, put some pressure on employers to actually live up to that um, that supplier code of conduct. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, Brian, that's a really another fascinating dimension to this. You know, really, really interesting campaign and. To echo what Walton has said, I mean, the the profile which this campaign has got, not only in America but beyond, has been a credit to your good selves and we would just like to congratulate you on what a fantastic campaign and even Thanks. getting a great degree of prominence in the national papers like the New York Times, who I know have been writing extensively in this campaign right. and this dispute. Uh, I mean, I've just a couple of questions that I'd like to uh, ask and follow on uh, in relation to the supply chains and the element of Costco. And I think that would be fascinating because Costco is a company that operates in the UK. And any pressure that people who are watching this YouTube clip or downloading it onto iTunes, that we can also apply pressure in the UK to write to Costco management, whether it's based in the UK or to America. How can members, trade union members beyond America and indeed across the world get involved in this campaign to apply pressure, even if it's not in Palermo's, but on 
the support the supply chains such as Costco. How can trade union members across the world get involved in this campaign as well as donating to the strike fund? Yeah, so uh, yeah, of course, donating to the strike fund um, it would be uh, an easy way for people to support. They can go to our um, our blog, uh, www.sliceofjustice.com, and look for the uh, donate button there and make a contribution to the strike fund. Uh, that's the first thing we would ask for. And um, you know, in terms of the this um, the supply and, and the distribution chain. Um, you know, we haven't really looked at the supply chain so much in terms of where the products are. Uh, you know, the um, the products are coming from the raw materials that they use. I, uh, we think probably most of it is is locally sourced um, or sourced from the from the U.S. Um, but in terms of distribution, Costco is the only uh, national uh, distributor. But because Costco does have international stores, they are you know it is the same entity, so it does make sense for people around the world. Uh, in the UK and Australia in particular, uh, to uh, see if there's a, a Costco retailer near uh, where they live and actually go to the uh, Costco retailer in person, um, the, go to the Costco store in, in person and, and bring this issue up and, and mention that they know that Costco has a supplier code of conduct and a reputation as a good uh, corporate citizen and that, um, you know, as trade unionists, they expect Costco to honor that uh, supplier code of conduct, not just to protect, you know, um, uh, workers, say, in the third world um, that people might typically think of as, as the most exploited, um, you know, by, by international corporations, but that Costco should also res respect the supplier code of conduct, um, or excuse me, should uphold the supplier code of conduct with regards to workers in the United States that make products that are sold at Costco. It's important for people to know also that the Palermo's pizzas that are made for Costco are not called Palermo's at Costco. They're given a, a private label brand that's Costco's private label called Kirkland. And so Costco has the ability to, um, you know, put that Kirkland brand on any number of products it, it wants to, including Palermo's pizzas. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's another way that folks around the world um, can, um, can support, um, you know, can support the, the strike um, locally. And, um, you know, encourage people to go to our, our website, encourage people to, to find us on Facebook, um, help us get the message out. Um, some of our, our other targets, um, sort of on the distribution and things with the boycott, are some major U.S. Um, um, sporting teams, professional sports teams, um, as well as some universities. Um, for example, the University of Wisconsin um, uh, has two campuses here in the state of Wisconsin, um, that um, uh, that sell Palermo's at the university um, in the you know in the student union at the food court, but also in their stadiums um, for football games and indoor um, sporting events like basketball games and hockey games. So we're also targeting these universities, um, asking them you know to to recognize the parallels between um, uh, licensing university apparel which most universities in the U.S. now are part of the workers, International Workers' Rights Consortium um, to make sure that um, sweatshop workers are not um, making uh, apparel that has a university uh, brand or logo on it. It's, it's the same thing here. You know, uh, we think universities, if, if they don't want um, apparel workers you know, to be suffering in sweatshop conditions uh, because it has the university's name on it, then um, they also shouldn't be putting the university's name um, uh, on, you know, endorsing uh, a pizza that's sold on their uh, campuses if the workers' rights are not respected. Um, and uh, so we're talking universities as well, um, including um, uh, University of Iowa in the state of Iowa. <clears throat> the other sports teams that are sponsored by Palermo's are the Kansas City Chiefs, um, and the Minnesota Twins baseball team, the Milwaukee Brewers here, um, and uh, the Chicago Bears. Um, and so, you know, that's another uh, way that we're looking to target um, consumers and sort of the, you know, the distribution chain. Unfortunately, it's difficult, I think, for international uh, trade unions to have an impact on, on some of those mm -hmm. uh, targets. So I think really the best one uh, for folks around the world is, uh, is to find a Costco store near them if they can. Just, just one thing I'd like to pick up on. I mean, you're just, just discussing the difficulties of trade unionists across the world getting involved and in, and some of those elements. However, I would encourage all trade unionists to go on these companies and sports clubs and institutions' Facebooks to their Twitter's like their Twitter account 
and to say we right. know what you're doing across the world and we don't believe that you should be associated with this company in light of how they're treating their workers. So I would appeal to all trade unionists and indeed gen general interested people, whether a member of a union or not, to get involved and in actually going on to these institutions and organisations website to say we know what's going on and we think you should be boycotting Palermo so Absolutely. that's something that we can do uh, even if we're not based in the Wisconsin the United States so I would appeal to everybody watching this clip and also listening to it on iTunes to contact some of the organisations that Brian's just referred to and to make them aware that people around the world know what Palermo's pizzas are doing and that their organization is associated with it and if, if you can yeah, give us a, if you can if you can send us a list of uh, of, of those sports teams and, and institutions which are using Paloma's Pizza what we'll do sure. is we will find the, the contact information we'll publish that on the website and we'll invite people to uh, express their opposition to the use of Paloma's products until the dispute is resolved that would be great um, do you mind talking about broader labor movement in the U.S. Um, sure. It, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. It's from our perspective here in the U.K., there seems to be quite a revival of union activity in, in, in the U.S., and there have been some very impressive disputes. The most impressive recent one, obviously, the Chicago Teachers Union, but we've seen right. um, we've seen Verizon, we've seen the Con Ed lockout in New York, um, we've seen the, uh, the, the football referees, we've seen... Um, a substantial amount of uh, union activism, which mm -hmm. I don't know whether I don't know whether they're, 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 there's an upsurge in it or it's just being reported more. But there seems to be there seems to be a lot of activity among U.S. unions, and they seem to be doing mm -hmm. quite well. Um, if if not um, winning, uh, certainly you know with its Governor Scott Walker in Wisconsin, certainly um, the profile has been quite good. And in a very very yeah. hostile environment uh, and right. Uh, a lot of the U.S. is still very anti-union. There have been some mm -hmm. significant victories, we think. So are we reading that right? Is there an upsurge in union activism? Yeah, you know, I think I think you are reading that right. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of this has to do um, with, you know, the, the um, uh, you know, the financial situation, <clears throat> um, the, um, the, you know, U.S., experienced the greatest recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s, um, you know, starting uh, in late 2008, um, when, um, uh, you know, President Bush was actually still in office and on his way out, the economy just tanked. And it shrunk pretty significantly then. Um, and, you know, rather than, um, um, you know, raise taxes on the 1% and the wealthy to help us uh, get through, you know, uh, this downturn in the economy and help spur growth, we've seen uh, the implement implementation of austerity measures um, at the state level, at the local level, uh, and sometimes at the federal level, even though we have a Democratic president with Barack Obama, he's had a very difficult time with um, a uh, U.S. Congress that's essentially um, been controlled um, for most of his time in office by the Republicans. So it's been very difficult um, to climb back out of this recession, and so the the attacks on working people have been increasing, and I think that's one of the main reasons why there's been such a, a significant um, um, uh, pushback from the working class, from organized labor, um, and, um, and and that's also be, uh, due to um, some of the um, attacks that you mentioned um, that are coming from the likes of Governor Scott Walker in Wisconsin. You know, that's part of a, a very concerted, coordinated effort. Uh, by an organization called the American Legislative Exchange Council, yeah. um, which uh, may, uh, some folks may have heard about, but they write these uh, model uh, bills and model legislation that they try to implement through Republican legislatures um, state by state on a whole host of issues, especially social issues. And it's a clear attempt um, to, um, you know, undermine the power of the working class, um, institutionalize, you know, the power of, of uh, the wealthiest 1%. And one of their main targets was uh, public sector unionism. Um, and as I said before, um, public sector labor law is governed um, uh, by state law. So it, it varies state by state. Um, and um, in Wisconsin, um, uh, 
Governor Walker's law has actually been declared unconstitutional um, in one lawsuit that opens the door for a whole host of additional lawsuits to uh, to um, uh, to what I think will ultimately repeal most of the bad effects of that law. Um, even though it's taken us a long time to fight back, um, the fight back in Wisconsin was absolutely ferocious, um, and I think it launched Occupy movement. Um, in the United States, um, you know, we occupied the state capitol building here in Wisconsin for um, for three weeks, um, and this was in February, um, you know, of 2011, um, uh, the year that um, the Occupy movement launched in um, in New York City later that September. So, you know, the fight act, you know, has has from Wisconsin, I think, has really spurred a lot of this labor activity. There was a similar attempt to undo public sector bargaining rights in the state of Ohio, uh, which failed. Uh, and, and yes, in the private sector, we've seen uh, a number of strikes as, as well. I believe the telephone workers went on strike in, in the East Coast. The Chicago teachers, as you mentioned, um, uh, had a huge uh, success um, in uh, just a week-long strike. Essentially, it was about 10 days, I think. Um, and, um, and you may have heard that uh, Walmart workers yes, um, in the United States you know, have, have walked out <clears throat> in a couple different locations in uh, near Chicago, Illinois, a warehouse, a huge intermodal uh, warehouse, not just a small distribution center, uh, that's the main uh, intermodal shipping station for, for uh, Walmart uh, in the Midwest of the United States. Um, and uh, and then also in California, I believe Walmart workers uh, walked out on strike at a couple stores. So I think there is an emboldening of the labor movement, but it, it's also because people, you know, realize that um, the attacks are increasing and continuing on working people because of the implementation of austerity. And um, I think people are, have realized the importance of solidarity um, and uh, participating in other workers' struggles and, uh, you know, doing everything we can to work together and overcome any old barriers that may have existed between uh, labor uh, and traditional allies, for example, um, labor and immigrants. And, you know, the labor movement in the United States has, has been supporting the immigrant rights movement for, for quite a few years now. Um, but, you know, those um, relationships and solidarity between labor and immigrant uh, workers, I think, is just increasing. Um, because I think folks realize that that's absolutely essential if we're going to beat back, um, you know, the uh, austerity regime. Thanks for that. Thanks for that response, Brian. And you're absolutely correct. We mentioned Walmart earlier in our conversation vis-a-vis -vis Costco and how workers have walked out in several depots in the state of California, which, again, like the state of Wisconsin, is facing the threat of uh, encroachment and union recognition and union bargaining that's on the agenda for the federal election so as you quite rightly have articulated we're seeing concerted and coordinated attempts by organizations to get state legislators to change the bargaining environment for trade unions and on the back of that private companies are coming in and trying to exploit that climate so i think not only Palermo's pizzas, but of course the labour movement in America is facing a concerted and coordinated attack, which you know we should be very mindful of and we should expose as much as possible. I think I would just like to say that I've been genuinely fascinated by the Palermo's pizzas campaign and the fantastic way that you've coordinated your campaign on the ground and in terms of social media. And I know over the coming weeks... Brian, that hopefully uh, our relationship will only grow. There's a number of Palermo's Pizzas events that will be happening in the near future that we are going to try and broadcast live from these events. But if we aren't able to do that, then certainly speak to a number of the workers because we want to support this campaign on an ongoing basis. And we hope that this conversation today will be one of many that we have with you and your colleagues and the workers who have been affected by the disgraceful tactics of this company. And I would just like to recap by saying you can visit the website, A Slice of Justice. You can also visit our website when we have a number of the different social media streams that can support this campaign on Palermo's Pizzas and our campaign section of the usilive.org website and we'd encourage anybody who's watching or listening to find out more about this dispute 
and to try and help the workers as much as possible by showing solidarity. I don't think there's really anything at this stage I would like to add, Walton, is there? Other than to thank you, Brian, for your generous time today. We will upload thank this you. onto YouTube. We will put it in iTunes. We will distribute this through all our social media streams that we have at our disposal to try and get the message out there and to try and apply pressure, not only Palermo's Pizzas, but Costco and the other organisations that you have highlighted earlier who are associated with this brand and getting that information from you so that we're able to put that on our social media streams also to help enable extra pressure in these companies would be absolutely fantastic. Brian, we Thank look you. forward to working with you, my friend, over the coming weeks until this dispute has the, the just resolution that it deserves. And it only leaves me to thank you today for your generous time and to please pass on to the workers who are involved in this dispute that people around the world are genuinely interested, we are concerned and we care and we stand ready to show any meaningful solidarity that we can with them. Well, thank you very much, Andrew and Walton, uh, for, you know, again, for the opportunity. And, and uh, we really appreciate the support uh, and the words of encouragement. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, the workers will be really excited um, about an opportunity um, to, uh, to join you again and, and you know, perhaps uh, reach out to, uh, you know, to a wide audience. Um, if, uh, if we can set up a live stream for a, for a worker forum and, and give uh, folks around the world an opportunity to ask questions uh, directly uh, to the workers themselves. Great. Thank you very much and thank you everybody who has stayed the course and watched this YouTube clip uh, live from Wisconsin uh, with Brian Rothjury and who perhaps has downloaded it onto iTunes and has listened to it. I hope you found it a very fascinating conversation. I know Walter and I certainly have and we look forward to this being one of many conversations with the workers at Palermo's Pizzas and their fight for a slice of justice.